Welcome back to Module 1, Unit 2 of our study of the Fundamentals of Operating Systems. This series of lectures is based on the book Operating Systems Concepts, 10th edition by Abraham Silberschatz, Greg Gagne, and Peter Galvin. I'm very grateful for the resources that the authors and the publisher provided for this series, thanks to everyone. As we discussed in the last unit, an operating system provides an environment for the execution of programs by making certain services available to programs and to the users of those programs. Let me remind you that these services also make the programming task easier for the programmer as we found when we spoke about the evolution of computers earlier. One set of operating system services provides functions that are helpful to the user. Almost all operating systems have a user interface which can take several forms. The user interface refers to the way we can interact with the computer. Today, a graphical user interface is the most common interface used. You'll see that abbreviated GUI. Mostly, the interface creates a collection of graphical windows that use a pointing device, your mouse, to direct the input and output. Select from a variety of options, including a menu system, and use the keyboard to enter the text. Mobile systems, such as smartphones and tablets, provide a touch screen interface, enabling users to slide their fingers across the screen or press buttons on the screen to select choices. Many of us have laptops that do the same thing. Another option is the command line interface, which uses text commands and a method for entering them in a specific format with specific options. Maybe we'll demonstrate that sometime later. I remember when we first started using the graphical user interface. Many of us experienced geeks hated them <laughs> because we had to click our way through a whole series of screens to complete a task that we could have easily done with a short text command. However, the learning curve for that command line interface was huge when compared to the GUI. I became an advocate when I saw a three-year-old child loading up her favorite learning program with her mouse. That graphical user interface brought computing into the home in a way that could never have been possible if everyone had to learn all those commands. Today, the computer with its graphical user interface is a valuable tool for virtually the entire population, not just some collection of techies. Some systems provide two or all three of these variations. Systems must be able to load a program into memory and to run that program. The program must be able to end its execution either normally or abnormally. Running a process may require input and output, which may involve a file or another input-output device. For specific devices, special functions may be desired such as reading from a network interface or writing to a file system. For efficiency and protections, users cannot usually control input-output devices directly. Therefore, the operating system must provide a means to handle input and output. Obviously, programs need to read and write files and directories. They also need to create and delete them by name, search for a given file, and list file information. Finally, some operating systems include permissions management to allow or deny access to files or directories based on file ownership. Many operating systems provide a variety of file systems, either to allow personal choice or to provide specific features or performance characteristics. There are many circumstances in which one process needs to exchange information with another process. Such communication may occur between processes that are executing on the same computer or between processes 
that are executing on different computer systems tied together by a network. Communications may be implemented via shared memory in which two or more processors read and write to a shared section of memory or by message passing in which the packets of information in predefined formats are moved between processes by the operating system. The operating system needs to be detecting and correcting errors constantly. Errors may occur in the CPU and memory hardware. Such might be caused by memory error or power failure. Input-output devices may experience error conditions such as those caused by parity error on the disk, a connection failure on the network, or a lack of paper in the printer. The user may generate errors such as an arithmetic overflow or an attempt to access illegal memory locations caused sometimes just by bad program code. For each type of error, the operating system should take the appropriate action to ensure correct and consistent computing. And sometimes the darn thing just halts the system. But often it might terminate an error causing process or return an error code to a process for the process to detect and possibly correct. Another set of operating system functions exists not for helping the user, but for ensuring the efficient operation of the system itself. Systems with multiple processes can gain efficiency by sharing the computer resources among the different processes. An important responsibility of the operating system is to allocate its resources to the running processes. When there are multiple processes running at the same time, resources must be allocated to each of them. Some of the resources, such as the CPU cycles, main memory, and file storage, may have a special allocation code, whereas others, like input-output devices, may have much more general request and release code. For instance, in determining how best to use the CPU, operating systems have CPU scheduling routines that consider the speed of the CPU, the process that must be executed, the number of processing cores on the CPU, and other factors. There may also be routines to allocate printers, USB storage drives, and other peripheral devices. It's important to monitor which programs use resources, how much they use, and what kind they use. This record keeping may be used for accounting so that users can be billed or simply for accumulating usage statistics. Usage statistics may be a valuable tool for system administrators who want to reconfigure the system to improve computing services. If you haven't heard about concerns of protection and security regarding information, then you've been living in a cave. The owners of information stored in a multi-user or network computer system may want to control use of that information. When several separate processes execute concurrently, it should not be possible for one process to interfere with the others or with the operating system itself. Protection involves ensuring that all access to system resources is controlled. Security of the system from outsiders is also important. Such security requires each user to authenticate himself or herself, usually by means of a password, to gain access to system resources. It extends to defending external I.O. devices, including the network adapters, from invalid access attempts and recording all such connections for detection of break-ins. So an operating system must allocate resources, monitor resources, deallocate resources, protect resources quite a bit. Well, since this is our first video in the second unit of Module 1, let's make it a short one. Let's make it uh, stop right here so that you can go over your notes, uh, record some of the information that you have heard, maybe review a little bit. I certainly hope that you downloaded the study guide for this unit.
because that will be very helpful to you in understanding and remembering the information that you are seeing and hearing in this series of videos. Now the way that study guide is set up, it gives you topics that will be discussed in each unit. It also gives you a little space so that you can make some notes about what you're hearing and seeing so that you will be prepared for the check your knowledge quizzes and the end of module exams. So let's go ahead and stop, go over your notes, and when you're ready, come on back for lesson two of module one, unit two.